I want to talk about a really difficult moment in this heroine's journey. Um, it's the most difficult moment. It, it seems that that what happens before this journey is preparation, and what happens after this moment is a whole different set of challenges, which we'll talk about. But this one is really the descent into the peril of being a founder. Mm. And peril is a really important word because peril implies that the outcome is uncertain. Mm. When, when the hero's in peril, uh, it is not a given that the hero will be saved or succeed. And in fact, if we know anything about human history, it's the heroes and heroines who were unable to survive the peril. Yeah. So I want to talk about, for you, you had an experience with peril, it seems to me, in a way, when you first tested as a student and the system came back with a very clear indication of who you were. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I, I look at this peril as a moment where there's no retreat. You're surrounded, right? Like, um, because retreat is a very effective tactic if used properly. Um, so you're, you know, you either survive or you're destroyed, and options for maneuver are limited. There is no way 10-year-old Tom is going to be able to argue with a state testing system. So I got, uh, we did a basic skills assessment, which is a, an aptitude assessment in some components. You know, probably one of the reasons why I became obsessed with aptitude assessments um, was the outcome. And, you know, I told my mum I finished first. She thought that was pretty funny she knew what was about to happen and I got rated in the the bottom sort of one percent of the state and they told pretty much that there's something wrong with me do you remember how you found that out I yeah yeah my parents didn't tell me you know I, I think I think around that similar age is when the time you attend like your your parent-teacher interviews, and you know what's going on. So it was your teacher who told you? Well, I was in the parent-teacher interview, and I was having a great time, you know, blissfully unaware with what anything meant. you got to remember, too, my sister got in the top 1%. So right. there's a... <clears throat> you know, as a young parent, this must be an interesting moment you know, to have this. And the teacher's crying to my parents. She's like, I don't know what to do for this child. That's when I realized something was really wrong. Mm. Like it, it caused a breakdown. Like I'm not the one crying at school anymore. <laughs> I've made the teacher cry. I'm not really, you know, I don't have a discipline challenge. I don't, so what is she? What's she crying about? Pity. Pity, yeah. And so that is the definition of peril at that moment. Well, you know, the teacher's got to tell her, you know, you know, two years earlier, my sister's school captain of that primary school. You know, he's the best student and this one of the best students in the state. And she's now telling the same family that their son is a dumbass. And I don't know how to teach him. So when you saw her tears and you realized something was wrong and then you got the news, what does young Tom do in that moment of peril when he's surrounded by a system that says he's not very bright? And there's limited resources to help him. <clears throat> I waited. I forgot this for a long time until I was in a com as a commander. I didn't remember it till I was a commander, but I was so driven to get to that goal of being that human from those journals and book club. And I was so driven to be a warrior to be tested that I just I stopped waiting and I waited. At some point. Um. My mother just did something courageous. Which was? 
she went and found a better teacher. And made sure of it. Yeah. Made the case. Right off the year and made the case. Don't put him behind. Convinced Barbara that the test is not right. Take the chance. Don't leave him behind. So that door... Hmm. I remember sitting outside the room. I never, I never, I don't know what was heard, but I know from what I know of my mother that that, that was the pitch that was made. Right. Yeah. Right. So the first response in peril hmm. is to wait. Yes. We're taught to think in peril requires immediate action. Confidently wait. Right. Confidently wait. And you were confident. Very true. Yeah, I knew. I was. I thought you were going to be first in your class, so. Yeah, I was <clears throat> fastest. What do you mean? You know, you could say it was ignorance of the situation, but you know, I also knew I could take my sister on right. and beat her. Right. Not physically, mentally. Right. So how could I take the best? And she asked me for advice and how to solve problems, but yet I'm so far away from her that. That didn't add up to me. I knew that. And kudos to my sister. She spent a lot of time talking to me. And she would hand me her books to read. And she talked to me about the books. I didn't realize how important that was that she did that for a long time. Does she understand your gratitude today? I'm not sure. Another conversation. <clears throat> so, so... Go now to to the soldier hmm. who who arrives on the battlefield where peril is now not a metaphor hmm. but a real thing. And in this moment of warfare, you are separating yourself from all those who think of the hero's journey as a kind of spiritual, mythological <clears throat> interiority. You are now in a place where you a mistake costs you your life. Where did you learn about peril in the war? What, what, what was an experience of peril, of being surrounded? And what did you do? So there's an idea of um, no one's coming. It's a, it's a junior leader tactic in the military. And people tell you, you know, there's all these systems. And, you know, the chances that one of these helicopters or Planes is above you. Depends on the day. So it could be 90%. You're the only mission. Or it could, you could be... And someone's deciding. And it's not a first come, first serve. It's a severity and importance. So you're it's effectively taught to be resourceful in every situation. And in the worst situations. And asking for help is a last resort. Mine wasn't... What, it, what I thought it would be. It was a... It was just me in the arena. Um, and it wasn't physical. It was moral. But it, it, if done incorrectly, it would have led to extinction. So we have this situation that occurs in the, the camp that, and we're providing all of the bodyguards to... Um, this advisory group, they send in advisors to the, the Afghani army. And the Taliban had been infiltrating the military and posing as the military and conducting what they call an insider attack. So you, they're dressed as you, but they're not, they're not in your team. And, you know, there's this huge threat occurs out of nowhere. And um, we find out later that the, the chief intelligence officer of the Afghan army is actually Taliban. So the Green Berets end up taking him out and arresting him. And it all occurs within a mile by a mile area. It's a, a core. So it's a, it's a lot of people. It's in multiple divisions. You know, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a large... You've got to think that the Afghans have more soldiers in this area than the whole Australian army does. And the Australian army is advising them. Right? It's a bit of a strange problem. Anyway, um, 
the team is an Australian-led team that works for an American allied organization that the Americans command and is attached to an American division. It's under protection of an American division around this province, Kandahar. It's with the home of the Taliban. It's all one of the oldest provinces in Afghanistan. It's called Kandahar. It's very, very old. So the Taliban is like their home. They're never going to leave. So we're doing all these missions where we protect these advisors and we go in and the advisors are European. Yeah, no, they're Australian. <clears throat> they're American. They're Pol. Like there's there was all British. these different. Mostly Australian, mostly American. Australian commander, American boss. And my platoon was like 40, 40 Australians. You know, about you know arguably any at any time, you know between five and twenty Americans soldiers. They worked for me. You know, they reported to me. I used to go and report to an American colonel um, on the base, um, and I was. You know, and so we have this, you know, we're allies, right? But we're also on an allied mission, and we've also got an American boss. Something really bad happens. And um, I send, like, a, I, I'm sitting in the headquarters, like this little command post, and it's not it's probably the same size as, you know, maybe this chair. And, and as, you know, I've, I run the quick reaction force when there's an issue. And the Americans were, a certain group of Americans were. Couldn't get out. They were trapped. Trapped. Yeah. Surrounded. Hundred percent. Yep. By hostiles. At the time, we thought it was yeah. Yep. Something bad. So we went in, and I got them. I reacted the Australian Quick Reaction Force. Even mind you, it's got Americans in it. And um, I go in and I, I get everyone out. Is it is combat necessary to do that, or is it just resourceful movement? Uh, it's at this, you know, we think we're going into a, a really tricky, you know, suicide bomber, um, threat inside a threat. Right. <clears throat> we don't know what the threat is. We know it's there. It's, you know, the base has been acted. The Afghans are locked down. They're about to start clearing the place out and they are going to start shooting everyone. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's got to get out of there. The only person that sort of didn't leave was the American general who was in there because he, he really can't. Do you know what I mean? Like he's sort yeah. of got to stay. Well, yeah, it's his job, and he was a warrior. Like, the camera was a warrior. Like, yeah. he was a real warrior, you know. And, you know, so we, we went and got him out, and I, I came back in. I was like, yeah, mission done. Let's move on. Like, it was a big deal. No one's dead. No one's injured. Um, thank you, lucky stars. Green Braves have got the guys. Everything's good. My, the American, the Australian colonel, or running the advisory group. Now, you got to understand, I'm in command of all of, protection all of the combat he's not even though his rank is much higher right it's not his unit i'm not attached to his unit i'm sort of delegated it's a weird sort of environment and he sort of comes out in front of this whole parade ground you know the vehicles are here and all the soldiers are taking all that stuff off and you know all the advisors are you know you know who advisors like consultants right now and they're having a sigh of relief like, like that was you know, whew, thank god got that done yeah, cool. And I'm just like taking all my things off. And he comes at me in front of everyone. You know, I'm not a not an intimidating figure at this point. And I'm just looking at him. And he reads something called a caution. And a caution is a it's like a statement. It's almost like your rights that the police read to you before they arrest you. So he's cautioning me because he's going to charge me. And he's going to charge me for breaking his order of me going in the camp and getting everyone out. And then he proceedingly goes on to say, you will not risk an Australian life to save an American soldier on my watch in front of his American subordinates working for an American headquarters in front of my American soldiers. How do you respond to that as a 22-year-old? So, you know, I know what's coming next. It's going to be you either get in line or you're court-martialed or I send you home. I'm not going to call my, I haven't done anything wrong. Like, this guy would never be able to prove. Right, but he could send you home. He could destroy you. And so, you know, in my mind, I'm going, why is it a perilous situation? And it's not romantic. 
but it is an extinction event because if I'm not here, there is no one that could protect them from this person. No one. There's no other chain of command here. It's no company commander. He's up north in a different province. I'm detached. I haven't, I've got no oversight from an American regiment and you know division. It's just, this, he knows what he's doing. He knows what, why he's threatening. He knows that he's going to use a line of, you either get in line or you can't look after your men. And he knows that I'm the type of character that would respond to that charge. So what happened? I l I looked at him for a long time. And like within that time, I was processing that the organization <clears throat> that I'm a part of is not really what it says it is. And the work that we're doing isn't really that valuable. And it's not, and I'm remembering, and I had a comment about great officers care about mission completion first, then their men, then themselves. And there's a book written by a great American special forces guy that's called Mission Men and Myself. It's something like that. It's like, it's pretty much, they're the order of things. And I'm going through this cycle. I'm like, the mission's got to come first. The mission I did correctly. So we're all good there. The men. Am I really going to put the men before my career? When it just started, and I worked so hard to get it. And, and I wait and I look and everyone is watching. And I just tell him in a really quiet, but loud enough so people can hear that no matter whatever you tell me, I will always go in get our allies out because that is our job and if you want to send me home because of that then fucking go for it and did you say that mm -hmm. and what did he say because now that's insubordination of the first rank it is yeah so what did he say nothing just walked away no one said anything did anything ever happen after that? No. <clears throat> so what I love about that story. But it felt like a long, yeah. long time. In between what he read me and what I said. Right. So there again, waiting. Mm. Waiting and not passively waiting, reflecting, sorting through. Sorting through. Yeah, is the, is the work more important than the men? Yes, we've done that today. Are the men more important than me? Yes, we've done that today. And it was like, when you're really confronted with your ideal and you put your ideal out there and the world says, okay, it's time to test it. You think it's going to be this grand physical display of you're all surrounded you know you can be a hero put your men first be the last man out no it was like i'm going to cancel everything that you've worked so hard for to me that was what my challenge was i don't know if it's harder than the other one but it was testing my ideal right front and center in the first eight weeks of being there isn't it fair to say that what you learned about peril in that moment was that it often runs deeper than just the content? You, you met the peril of the moment. You got everybody out. But that wasn't the peril. The peril was when you saw that the system you were working for was corrupt. Or, yeah, and, and I had nowhere to hide. And you had nowhere to hide. Yeah. <clears throat> and so with nowhere to hide, 
you had to go through your internal checklist. You had to wait, you had to go through your checklist. And then you had to reaffirm what's at stake, right? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's be really clear, like he put me in an environment where everyone saw, so I couldn't hide. So I couldn't turn around and just go, hey, sir, maybe you should take a moment. Couldn't do that. You might have done that if you were alone in an office. I Probably. It's like, hey, I think you do. And I'd go speak to the sergeant major and be like, hey, he needs to sleep or some shit. He needs to figure some shit out. But he didn't. He was like, it's time for you to join time for you to get in line he'd been waiting for that moment I think so yeah yeah so what do we say to the founder who meets peril remember this is not setback this is not adversarial challenge this is an identity moment because when you answered that question when you met that peril you faced it down because you were going to go home you could have and would have, after eight weeks, gone home in shame. And you wouldn't have been in shame, but the system would have shamed you. What does that say to founders who feel surrounded and that there's no way out? And they can say, well, it's all very good that you waited. It's all very good that you reflected. But you don't understand. My peril's going to annihilate me. What do you say to them? I'm going to lose everything. My company, my money, my family, my friends, everybody's going to think I'm a failure. I mean, I'm, this one is bigger than some moment with a general on a field, man. This is like everything's going to go up in flames. Yeah. What are you saying? I think, that, I think you can get annihilated. Like it's not a fear. It will definitely happen if you let it. I also don't think being annihilated which is like destruction of all power there's one thing that no one can take away from you it's your will so you don't have to quit if you're annihilated you don't have to quit if you're annihilated you just have to survive do all founders have to meet that moment or to do they, they don't I think a lot don't I think a lot should I think a lot of people would want them to meet it <clears throat> if they told people what was going on. And why don't they tell people what's going on? I don't know. Yeah. You know, the, no general likes to be... The general likes to admit that they're surrounded. Because the question is, how the hell did you get yourself surrounded? Correct. You missed something. You missed something. Yeah. So, can you talk to me in this moment of peril? Can you talk to me about the presence of the, the legitimate presence of the egoic self? It's my idea. It's my company. It's my reputation as a young commander. I've been the top of the top all the way through. Here I am being dressed down in front of everyone. My answer is going to annihilate my, my career as a warrior, and that's all I've been focused on round the clock for longer than four years of training, longer, longer. <clears throat> what is it? that allows you to survive the prospect of annihilation? Is it just stubbornness, cussedness, the desire to be useful? How does one survive the peril of annihilation? Uh, well, I think in that circumstance, I, it's probably a little bit of luck. I don't want to deal with this guy today. Like, <laughs> you know. Um. I understand you'd make that case, but you know as well as I do. That's not what it was. Mm, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what the other person was thinking. I've never asked. Hey, one, one thing that I think people need to understand that is uh, 
being annihilated and feeling like you're annihilated are different. So, you, know, you would often feel like you were constantly getting drowned and you know, cornered as a founder. But they weren't, it wasn't real. You weren't actually getting enveloped. You were, you were just, you were just, you know, as you would say, they didn't have the right partners. You know, I'd never been on a meeting until I was on a meeting with Tucker Capital that ended in a positive compliment to me ever. Ever. Literally ever. Why? I don't know. It, uh, someone described it to me once as that you always seem to be, you always seem to know what to do. You always move. So people think that you... Don't need anything. You don't need anything. Um, <clears throat> I also probably spoke too quickly because everyone would just adopt my position. And that's tricky because if you're doing something really novel, you actually have to talk to start. You actually do have to start a lot of conversations because you never get to the real conversation. You know, it's a, it's a trick. Um, you know, it's easy to be a leader and not talk if, you're a, if you own a realm that's well-defined. It's like, okay, everyone presents their case and then I'll talk. It's like, yeah, but that's if it's founded and it's established and it's a bureaucracy, but not if it isn't, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think most of it is, you know, here's the problem. I'm not employable. I know that. I have the opportunity to create and invent, to be useful. The things that, if you create something, the legacy is longer. So you could drive, my, my friend's dad was a builder. His kids would be like, my dad built that house. It's a fascinating thing. And then like he, my dad, my sister would be like, oh, dad, my dad built that shopping center. So when you build something, it, it becomes part of who you are, especially if it's physical. So you sort of, you know, you know, you're, you're figuring out as you go through this, like this imposter sort of concept and doubt comes from, shit, I'm not employable. I can't hide in the system. I have to contribute to it. But it can go wrong. And I'm going to be known for that. So they sort of, they always feel like they're getting annihilated when a lot of the time it's not a real event. Right. And then if that happens enough times, <clears throat> it's really hard to figure out what's real and what isn't. So what you're saying... Especially makes, if you don't talk to customers. Right. Yeah. You're making me think about peril in a different way. Mm. What is it... How does peril, what are the mistakes we make that put us in peril? Let's go back to the general that doesn't want to talk about it because he missed something. When founders find themselves in peril, in the instance you've given us, there's nothing you missed, you didn't miss. In that sense, it feels like the luck of the draw. You had an insecure commander who thought he had a moment of leverage and he didn't. Mm. And so he, he made his play and walked away. That's the element of luck, I get it. But oftentimes, when you get surrounded, you did miss something. So can you think about in your life as a businessman where you got surrounded because you missed something? You got into peril, you're responsible for some of the peril that you got involved in. I would say I'm responsible for all of the peril I got involved in. Yeah. And what did you miss? Because they're probably all examples of the same peril. I had a misunderstanding of um, <clears throat> that that the people that extract value actually exist. Like uh, miners actually exist. You know, they can't be changed. You can't trick them. I sort of like they're this. When you start a company, you're on this steam and you attract people that want to solve the problem and you get innovators and then they have early adopted and this is where it gets tricky after you get past this point and they want to change. So you believe that you can change what they think. But there are some people, they're whatever it is. They're extractors. They just they don't want to create value. They want to contribute to the value and the good ones will tell you both those things. 
and then extract it because they know they'll get you at an optimum level when they do it. And I truly believe I could change. I could be the stock or the vanguard that would make them think that going along on ideas is better than extraction. Yes. And I, and was, so and I was very wrong in that. So the hero creates his own peril. All the time. I think I think it's yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if the hero creates her own peril, mm -hmm. is it her responsibility to get out of the peril? Or is there luck involved? Mm -hmm. Or cunning or brazenness what how do how do how do heroes survive the peril i mean this is the dragon's this is the monster this is the monster's voice yeah it's a well the hero's first job i think after waiting for a little bit and thinking about it is to move as many people out of the peril as you can. It's like the Titanic situation. Let's get as many women and children on these fucking boats. Because they're the heirs. Let's get them out of here. So do. it's the second component, mission. You've got to save as many people as you can from the fucking thing. Right. Then, you can annihilate me, but let me get people out of the way. Then, yeah, correct. And then you've got to convince the small group of people left. Still left. That are warriors that are of this point don't want to follow you because you've led them into peril. And they all have that moment. Whether it's I could have done it better, whether it's you missed something, or whether it's I'm just tired. Like I've been following you for a long time. This is, you know, we haven't been paid yet. Yeah. And you have to convince them that there is a chance of survival of the story surviving not them and that's worth running straight into the peril for and that is more important than us physically surviving and maneuvering for it. The idea that what we've done is more important than what we'll ever do. And there's only a chance that that story will be told the right way. And then what effectively happens after that is calm. And I saw it, it was just calm. And um, then you have to tell people exactly what you need them to do for the first five to 10 minutes of whatever it is you're about to take on. And that's what it felt like to me. So your way out of the peril is to swim right to the center of it, to get to the source of it, get people out of the way, convince those who can go with you that you're going to the source of it because the story's survival is more important than anything else. Everything you've, you may be tired because you've followed me. You may have thought you could do a better job, but everything you've worked for is about to be annihilated. And that's very different than us being annihilated because we won't be annihilated. We'll get up, and we'll all do our thing and survive. But our story can be annihilated. Yeah, like you, you can... Maybe... And the monster needs your story to be annihilated, by the way. That's the point. Well, yeah, it's like... A, um, you can physically be annihilated. You could lose your career. You could lose everything. You could... Your self-doubt could corrupt you to a point of you don't want to exist. Like the and you've lost plenty of friends the, in the last few correct, years. Correct. The risk is there. We know the... The trouble is, too, when you've got warriors that know the cost of the risk. So it's like there is a slim chance that someone at a bar will tell the story of our last stand. Slim chance. But if that story gets told and someone picks up the baton and then 
goes further, then this opportunity becomes a responsibility. So that's one important. So if we think about descent, Campbell thought of it as initiation and peril. I, I, I think it's more about this subject of peril. It's almost like the gift of the descent is ultimately the willingness to sacrifice self in service of people, the mission, people, the story. Mm. That that's the, the greatest peril of all is to have to face one's own annihilation mm. in service of a story that might get told, might get told in a bar yeah. somewhere else and catch the flame of a founder or a fighter. Yeah, it was an interesting thing because in some ways I was like the <clears throat> first veteran that wasn't a t-shirt company, a rifle company, uh, a coffee company, a book, a mental health advocate, a physical trainer, which are all brilliant things. I was like the first one that was like, if, I, if we fail here, they were right. They were right that you were all fuck ups. Yeah, that we're the problem. <laughs> Doesn't matter all the work we've done. They're, they're looking for that reason to not listen to what we have to say. So can I ask you about another peril then that falls into this business life? Which is that if we think of the monster as the many headed, blind, sleepy beast that can see in, in all directions and chooses above all to promote the lie that there are no human beings, there are only commodities and assets. <clears throat> Is it fair to say that the greatest peril you faced was the lie that soldiers were second rate, that you were the problem and not the society that incubated you, that in some sense, like your story, the commander's statement, his caution, writ large is the system. Mm. And your answer, writ large, is the founder's answer. I will always put my allies at the center of my attention. Mm. Mythologically, it's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? The system wanted you to believe you're the problem. And your work with you with me was determined to say, we're actually the solution, not the problem. Yeah. How did that work out? Both narratives have had early success. But the story is not finished. So we'll see. Yeah, there and again, this very powerful tool of waiting. There's, a, there's something you're saying about waiting which seems extremely important mm. because founders are driven by urgency. Yeah, it's interesting. The real interesting uh, ironic moment is like, a, or even satirical, is that we ignored this argument. We were like, no, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to, Lean into the positive. We're going to show you the potential of everyone, not just veterans, everyone. But in the end, they, they really did not let us not address it, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Well, your, your determination to save all your allies, they wanted you to put Australians first. Yeah, it's a... Yeah, it's not a... No, so, there's no winner at the moment. <clears throat> So at this particular moment in time, mm. the thing you created, you created a company that demonstrated what it could do, became the fastest growing company in the Southern Hemisphere. It gave jobs to vet 
journalists and others who society wanted to say were not employable. It gave a pathway to those who were struggling with being able to see their own strengths, to see themselves as agentic and in the world. You built the company, you raised the money, and yet the journey, the shareholder journey, the investor journey, the extractor journey, the extractors did what they do, no, no blame, they're extractors, they do what they do. Yeah. <clears throat> and as a founder, you've stepped out. Mm -hmm. Painful? Excruciating. Why? It's like um, you create a realm. The realm then gets asked to go do more things. You being the person that created the realm is the best place to do that work. But the further you've gone from the realm, the further the realm is not yours. And um, everyone forgets how the realm was created, why it was created, and looks for a way of owning it. So it's excruciating. You know, at this point, you're more tired than most. You've seen so many of the same things unfold, unfold again. You've probably avoided peril a few times. You've inflicted peril a few times and you've dealt with real problems a lot of the time. You've invested a lot in individuals, but you haven't crafted social contracts that make them allies. And you just lose. But you don't lose the important fight that was outside the realm. You won that. So it's a real conflicting moment. Why is it that I win but I still need to lose? So this is the frame for that next stage of that hero's journey, the overcoming the ordeal. I would like to say to you that my friendship and knowledge of you was crafted at the highest moment of peril mm. in your business life. I saw you surrounded. Uh, I saw you encountering forces that you could not countermand. And you are a different founder today than you were then because you were not annihilated. Mm. Many of the things that you sought to do were taken from you. But the fullness of who you are, there's something in the secret of how you got there, how you overcame the ordeal that I want to talk about next. Mm. Because it doesn't mean that it isn't still excruciating. I get the pain. That's never going to go away. Mm. I get that there is a sense of betrayal and a sense of loss. But you are unbowed now. In a way that I met you, you were really wrestling with the peril. Mm. And I think one of the things I want people to understand as they look at these conversations is that you are not some founder sitting back Steve Jobs style saying, this is how I built Apple. This is how it all went. You are in midstream. You are in peril now. You are in midstream of this journey and you are overcoming this ordeal, your challenge of bringing it back to the community. You are becoming the elder. These are all on offer to you precisely because you went to the heart of the peril. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm hearing you say now is when you're surrounded, you move right to the middle of the peril. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? I think so. I think um, what's interesting is that I'm, I'm experiencing moments of pride 
of not my work, but of the organization's work. Right. That's a really odd <clears throat> thing to experience, excruciating pain and pride at the same time. And therein lies our next conversation. Mm. So thank you very much. Thank you.